We all know the phrase, if at first you don't succeed, uh, let's try that again. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try, try. yeah, um, we know that we say it quite often, but that saying presupposes something, and that's that when you try again, you don't do it the way you did the first time. If at first you don't succeed, do it exactly as you did and you'll fail again, most likely. But if at first you don't succeed, learn and tweak, do it differently. Try and try and try again, and usually it leads to success. Uh, I have two standout fail moments in my life. Uh, I'm sure none of you have failed at anything, it's just me. But I have two standout fail moments. One of them, I was 17. Uh, in the UK, you get your provisional driver's license at 17. Uh, you can sit your test anytime when you're 17. And uh, just, I'm going to preface this to try and save face a little bit. The driving test in the UK is a lot different to the driving test here, and it is hard. The one here is rather easy. But um, I was doing my driving lessons with my instructor, and it was right before Christmas, and I was looking at our Christmas plans, and I was looking, I was the second oldest person in my year. Uh, there was another person just a little ahead of me. She had her provisional license. I had my provisional license. We were both uh, doing our driving lessons, and I was like, because this is my personality, I have to win. She may be older than me, and she's been taking lessons a little longer than me. I'm going to finish my test first. Um, and so my goal was to get my test done right before Christmas so that for Christmas, uh, I could be the designated driver for my family. So I go to my driving instructor, I give him my grand plan, I'm going to go sit my test, I'm going to be done for Christmas, and he's like, I'm not sure you're ready yet. And me being me, looked to him and I was like, Martin, I have never failed anything in my life. If I think I'm ready, I am ready. And he goes, okay, it's up to you. I failed, right. <laughs> I failed miserably. I told all my friends I was sitting my test. I was going to beat Joanna and get there first. And lo and behold, I walk into school and everyone's like, how did you do? And I'm like, for the first time in my life, I failed. I'm such a failure and I'm so embarrassed. I'd never failed at anything in my life. That was my first big fail with all the bravado and overconfidence of a 17-year-old Scottish guy. Um, the, the second one, which is uh, the second standout failure for me, uh, happened, it, it ended up resulting in me losing a job. My brokenness, my stupidity uh, got the better of me. Uh, I lost my job, and I was looking at my life and decisions I'd made, and I thought, what on earth did I do to bring me to this situation? And all, all I remember, or, or the thing I remembered most of all of it, was sitting in my house, feeling like a complete failure, uh, feeling like it was the end of the world, I'd screwed up. I'd screwed up my plans. I'd screwed up God's plans. I had lots of those questions. Maybe it would have been better if I'd stayed at home. Maybe it would be better if I'd stayed in America. Maybe it would be better if I'd moved to Dubai with my dad. Maybe anything would be better than being in this situation where you feel like you failed and you know it's all your fault. Failure is so discouraging. Anyone been discouraged from things not going the way that they think it should go? <laughs> Um, we're in the book of Joshua, and uh, we are celebrating at this point in the book, what we're going to celebrate today is this amazing God who is gracious and who's patient, who's faithful, and as we know, who's masterful at taking the brokenness of the world and the failures that we engage in and turn them around to fulfill his promises. God is masterful at taking evil and turning it for good. Um, as we continue in Joshua, we're going to see God overcome the brokenness of Israel and turn around the situation that we were looking at last week to a way that glorifies him and elevates his people. So we've got to remember at this point in the story, right? So God's, we're going to go back a little bit, right? God rescued Israel out of Egypt. Uh, they 
grumbled against God, so they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years as a punishment. Uh, a whole generation has died. Moses has even messed up enough that God has removed him out of leadership, and now Joshua has been appointed as the leader. At uh, the beginning of Joshua, we're watching as God miraculously parts the Jordan River so that Israel can walk through into the promised land that they've been yearning for for generations. Uh, and then a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the Battle of Jericho. Uh, not much of a battle. Uh, the prayer walk of Jericho, where they wander around the city 13 times till God miraculously causes the walls to fall down uh, and the city being destroyed. And then last week, we look at this guy, Achan, or we like to call him Achan. We look at this guy who decides to keep the plunder that was forbidden. And as a result, uh, Israel goes up against the city of Ai and they're destroyed. Uh, they're defeated and they're at this point where they feel like they've failed, uh, where they're wondering what the story's going to look like from here. And it's at this point that we pick up in Joshua chapter 8. So we're going to read Joshua 8, 1 through 29. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I've delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Huh. Set an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You're to set an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. Uh, and all of you be on the alert. I and those with me will advance on the city. And when the men come out against us, as they did before, we'll flee from them. They'll pursue us until we've lured them away from the city, for they'll say they're running away as they did before. So when we flee from them, you're to rise up from ambush and to take their city. The Lord your God will give it into your hand. When you've taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded. See to it, you have my orders. Then Joshua sent them off and they went to the place of ambush and lay in wait between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night with the people. Early the next morning, Joshua mustered his army and he and the leaders of Israel marched before them to Ai. The entire force that was with them marched up and approached the city and arrived in front of it. They set up camp north of Ai with a valley between them and the city. Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So the soldiers took up their positions with the main camp to the north of the city and the ambush to the west of it. That night, Joshua went into the valley. Then Joshua sent them off and they went to the place. Is that the same verse? It is. Uh, when the king of Ai saw this, he and the men of the city hurried out early in the morning to meet Israel in battle at a certain place overlooking the Arabah. But he did not know that an ambush had been set against him beside the city. Joshua and all Israel let themselves be driven back before them and they fled toward the wilderness. All the men of Ai were called to pursue them and they pursued Joshua and were lured away from the city. Not a man remained at Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel. They left the city open and went in pursuit of Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, hold out toward I the javelin that's in your hand, for into your hand I will deliver the city. So Joshua held out toward the city the javelin that was in his hand, and as soon as he did this, the men in ambush rose quickly from their positions and rushed forward. They entered the city and captured it and quickly set it on fire. The men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising up into the sky, but they had no chance to escape in any direction. The Israelites who had been fleeing toward the wilderness had turned back against their pursuers. For when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that smoke was going up from it, they turned around and attacked the men of Ai. Those in ambush also came out of the city against them so that they were caught in the middle with Israelites on both sides." Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivors nor fugitives, but they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing all the men of Ai in the fields and in the wilderness where they chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those who were in it. 12,000 men and women fell that day. 
all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he destroyed all who lived in Ai. But Israel did carry off for themselves the livestock and plunder of this city as the Lord had instructed Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and and made it a permanent heap of ruins, a desolate place to this day. He impaled the body of the king of Ai on a pole and left it there until evening. At sunset, Joshua ordered them to take the body down from the pole and throw it at the entrance of the city gate. And they raised a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. Nice, happy passage for today. I'm going to... Here's what I'm going to do today is I'm going to skirt the thing that you really want me to talk about. Because there are a couple of uh, chapters coming where we're going to get into some of the violence and maybe some of the explanations for that. So I'm going to save that for coming up soon. And um, Today I want to look at th- this passage, Joshua chapter 8, is the do-over from what happened in Joshua chapter 7. And so if you've got a Bible, you might want to have both open. But I want to look at some of the contrast between 7 and 8 uh, and some of the clues that are in here in the passage that are revealing what went wrong the first time, uh, what they did differently this time, and some of the things that really shows a lot of things that get in the way of us being able to do the things that God wants us to do. So for you personally, there are things God wants you to do in your life and there are decisions that you will make that can get in the way of what God wants to do. It doesn't mean it's the end of the story. And then as we look at us as a church, as we continue to lean into what does God want for this community in this part uh, of the Portland metro area, uh, there are things that we do that will get in the way of what God wants us to do. So the first thing in the passage that gets in the way of our ability to do what God wants is is fear and discouragement. Uh, We were talking about this in pre-service prayer in a couple of the groups. Um, In pre-service prayer, we take time to intercede for the service, and then at the end, we, we give some space to listen. We ask the question, what might God want to say to us this morning? And there are a few comments that came up about just general discouragement and what it feels like to be fighting the same battle over and over again or new problems arriving and wondering if it will ever end. Uh, So if that's you, you're in the same boat as the Israelites are at this part of the story. The Lord said to Joshua in verse 1, do not be afraid, do not be afraid discouraged. I don't know if this is God just looking at Joshua and saying the things in front of us are difficult. You're going to be afraid, you're going to be discouraged, just in general, knowing what is coming. Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. If you remember back to chapter 1, like God's opening to Joshua, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. The Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. Keep the book of the law always before your lips, but I'm going to be with you. Be strong, don't be discouraged. I'm beginning to wonder if Joshua's personality is prone toward fear and discouragement. It feels like all the way through this book, God continually prompts Joshua with this language of do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. So that means there are people who just our personalities are more prone to feeling fearful with the things that, that, that are in front of us or more easily feel discouraged when things don't go our way. And, and then on top of that, you've got situations that we walk into that the situation of itself doesn't matter how uh, your personality is, they in, instill fear and discouragement in you. Um, I don't know that I would call myself a fearful or discouraged personality. I'm usually pretty optimistic. But I do know at the end of that driving test and and, uh, that situation where I lost my job, I do know I felt fear and I was discouraged. And what do fear and discouragement do? They completely paralyze us. Fear and discouragement are some of Satan's favorite tools to paralyze us from doing the things that God wants us to do. So God says, you know what? You should leave everything here and fly to the other end of the world to a a Muslim nation that hates Christianity and you should give your life to preaching the gospel to them knowing that you might die, right? Fear and and discouragement is the thing that the enemy is gonna use to stop that person from going there. And then even when they're there, it's fear and discouragement that says, I'm not gonna preach the gospel, I'm gonna be quiet, I'm... Uh, uh, because I I don't want to get caught out. Fear and discouragement paralyze us in the pursuit of God. 
So we're at the part of the story where um, Joshua has instructed the people based on the report of the, the spies, go into Ai, you only need 3,000 men, go with 3,000 men, you can take the city. Joshua takes their advice, he gives them the instructions to go, and, and 36 people die, uh, and, and Israel are chased away, and they're defeated. Their hearts are melting in fear like the enemy nations were supposed to rather than walking in confidence with God. So at that point, Joshua must be looking at his leadership going, 36 people are dead because of me. I sent the scouts. I asked them to check the land. I didn't verify it myself. I listened to uh, their advice. I made the decision to send 3,000 people I'm the one that didn't notice or didn't check to see that people had obeyed God's instructions. I may not be the one that stole the possessions that I wasn't supposed to take, uh, but it wasn't me. You imagine the, the, the discouragement he's in at this point. Having just watched the Red Sea part, having just watched the walls of Jericho fall, and I'm sitting at this point wondering if there's any use, is God even going to be with us? So God's opening words to Joshua, knowing his personality, knowing the situation, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. You know, there are people in the room today, and you need to hear those words today. Life has gotten a bit overwhelming. Things are not quite looking the way that you wanted. The problems are mounting up. The bank balance is getting a little lower. You thought you'd be in a different place in your journey at this point. You're not hitting the targets that you thought you would. You're not with the person you thought you would be with. Perhaps God is asking you to step out and, and uh, reach out to people with the gospel. And you're like, I just can't do it. God wants you to hear it again today. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. What's the opposite of fear in the Bible? It's not courage, it's faith. It's faith that allows us to fly in the face of fear and discouragement. It's faith that lifts us up above the circumstances to do what God wants us to do. Look back at Joshua chapter 7, verse 4, 5, and 7. About 3,000 went up. They were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Have you ever felt that way? If only I'd stayed in my last job. If only we'd stayed in our other house. If only we'd been content the way it was before because I was discouraged with that one and then I've stepped into this one and this one is miserable. You can identify with Joshua at this part of the story and so you need that encouragement from God. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. I think another thing we see in the passage, which maybe puts us on the other side of the personality spectrum, uh, or if you're unlucky, you'll have both. Uh, another thing that gets in the way of us being able to do what God wants us to do is impatience. Next verse, Joshua 8, 2. You shall do to I and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except this time you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. If Achan was alive in this moment, <laughs> what do you think he'd be thinking? What do you think the people around him that knew him and loved him are thinking at this moment? If you just waited. God told us to destroy all the stuff in Jericho. You took it for yourself. If you just waited. It was the very next battle where we get to take the plunder for ourselves. If you just waited. Um, I, we often look at Achan and we see, his, we, we see the sin, we see the greed that he took what was forbidden, we see the rebelliousness. I think we don't often stop and look at our sinfulness and see the impatience that lies behind it. It's not just that he took what was forbidden, it's he saw it and he wanted it now. He wasn't willing to wait to save up the money. He wasn't willing to wait for something down the line. He needed satisfaction now. 
Greed, when we engage in the sin of greed, it's really saying, I want lots and I want it now. I'm not willing to wait for it. It's impatience that says, I'm in a relationship, but I'm going to sleep with my partner even though we're not married. It, because I'm impatient. I can't wait for then. I need it now. It's impatience that causes us to sin by jumping from one job to the next because every time it gets difficult, every time something gets challenging, every time there's a conflict or you're not performing the way that you should and they don't like you, we're just like, we're just going to jump ship. We're not going to stick it out. We're not going to learn to work through conflict. We're not going to figure out what personality things are, uh, are malfunctioning in us. We're just going to jump. Uh, it's impatience that leads to helicopter parenting. I'm not going to give my kids time to figure this out themselves. I'm going to jump in now and I'm going to rescue them because I can't handle the tension of them being in a difficult situation. So I'm just going to solve it for them. Perseverance and grit are essential to following Jesus and they're essential for the healthy functioning of the church. It will often be our impatience that will stop us doing what God does because we'll jump into something else instead. I know around here, some of you get frustrated with me because I'm not moving fast enough. I get frustrated with me because I can't move fast enough at times. Um, but my goal here is always that we will take the time and patiently seek the will of God rather than just jump at the first opportunity that comes. Because I see time and time and time and time again in Scripture that it's our impatience that often leads us into sin. Um, if there is a perpetual sin issue that I deal with the most, Monica's smiling and laughing, it's impatience. It's impatience that causes me to be short with my kids. It's impatience that causes me to be abrupt with Monica. It's impatience that used to make me walk out the door and make her walk like 100 meters behind me because I wanted to be there on time. I wasn't willing to wait for a couple more minutes. That was like 15 years ago, growing, growing a little bit. Um, impatience is a sin that we don't talk about often enough. But if you were to take stock of your life, I'm sure you'll see lots of ways where you've uh, got, gotten in the way of what God wanted to do in you because you allowed your impatience to get the better of you. If, if Achan had just waited. There's lots in the commentaries uh, about why it was why God wanted Jericho destroyed and they couldn't take that plunder and why they were allowed to take this plunder. And honestly, in the commentaries I'm reading, I don't think they have the answer that I see in Scripture. Um, there's this principle all the way through scripture of first fruits. The first fruits are always given to God. Uh, one of the patterns from the Exodus as the Passover happened and destroyed the firstborn of all the enemy rulers, the firstborn child was to be dedicated to God and you had to essentially buy him back through sacrifice and offering from the Lord. God's principle has always been that whatever comes first is devoted to him. It's been seen all the way through the biblical story to this point. So Achan should have known that when you go in in this first city, it's going to be dedicated to God as first fruits. And then it's going to be fair game from that. But his impatience said, I want this and I want this now. How often we are guilty of impatience and how much we need the fruit of the spirit of patience to temper us to be able to persevere in the things of God, to be able to persevere into the promises that he has for us and to be able to stop ourselves from blundering impulsively into things that get us in trouble. I think the third one you see in the passage, I'm going to call overconfidence. Uh, and, and again, I, I'm basically just labeling me. So this is like confessions of a pastor today. Let's just sit here. Um, overconfidence. Look at Joshua chapter 8 verse 3. Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out that night. God has told Joshua, take all of them. Take all of them. What did he do in chapter 7? Not all the army is going to have to go. This is easy. So just send two or three thousand men and, and you'll do fine. Israel clearly felt bolstered in their faith by what God had done, that they're like, yeah, two to 3,000 men, that'll be great. We'll go and we'll take it. And I'm pretty sure if Achan hadn't done what he'd done, they would have been successful in the process. But what I love here is God's kindness and God's grace 
toward the people of Israel in this moment and even towards Joshua's leadership. He's like, you know, you're feeling nervous. I'm going to give you 10 times the number this time. Right? In case you're scared, let's load you up with 30,000 men. Um, is it faith? Is it overconfidence? Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between faith in God and being overconfident. Was it overconfidence Was that's the problem here or is it Achan's sin? The scriptures make it really clear that it's Achan's sin. But there is a confidence thing going on here. If sin doesn't lead us on one hand to fear or discouragement, if that's not your personality to get fearful and discouraged by what's going on, if sin doesn't lead you that way, sin's going to lead you to impatience and overconfidence. I've done this before. I can start a new Bible study. I've done that. I know what it is to feed the homeless. I've done that before. I know what it is to hire someone. I know how to lead worship. Uh, or when it's in our family, I know how to parent my kids. I've done it my whole life. I know how to parent my grandkids. I parented my own kids, right? We get overconfident and we get impatient and it leads us to be impulsive in the things of God. I wonder what would have happened uh, if this plan had been reversed. Don't get overconfident in God. We want to be confident. We want to have hope in God. But don't get overconfident in your own ability and then get in the way of what God wants us to do. You can summarize it all in this last one. They acted without God. This is, the, I think, the biggest contrast you see. It's not hinted at, or it's not mentioned in chapter 7, but you begin to see it in chapter 8. In chapter 7, when Joshua is making his plans, the Bible tells us Joshua sent out spies. Joshua listened to the report. Joshua sent an army out. In that whole passage, there is no mention of seeking strategy like God, as has happened in every point into that part, up to this point in the story. The only time that God's voice is heard in chapter 7 is when it's failed miserably. Joshua's on his face before the Lord, and God's like, stand up. What are you doing on the ground? Israel has sinned. But you didn't seek me. If you'd sought me before the battle, I would have told you that Israel had sinned. I would have told you to deal with it and 36 lives would have been saved. But you chose to do it without me. And then chapter 8 starts. So God says to Joshua. In chapter 18, God says to Joshua. And God gives him the strategy for how to do this. So we allow our fear, our discouragement, our impatience, and our overconfidence to get in the way of what God wants to do. And then so often that means we then step into or fail to step into the things God's asking us to, and we're doing it all without him. Fear and discouragement is, I'm here, I don't have enough, I can't do this, so I'm going to stay put and not do the things that God wants me to do. So that's me without God, in discouragement and in fear. Uh, Impatience and overconfidence says, here I am, I can do this. I've got this, I can take care of it, and I don't need God. Um, the story is reminding us, as it is over and over again, and I'm sorry if I'm a broken record with this on Sundays, because this is the crux of what we're called to do as Christians. We cannot do life and faith without God. We cannot do what God wants us to do without him. John 15, 5, we, we were praying about this this morning in pre-service prayer. John 15, 5, up, Jesus says to his people, apart from me, you can do nothing. And yet, we do everything apart from him. If we're honest, so much of what we do, how easy it is to live our life without him, to give in to fear, discouragement, impatience, overconfidence, so we don't see him, we don't pause and ask his will. We don't delay our gratification. And then if it doesn't go our way, we blame him. Right? It's your fault that I'm not being healed. It's your fault that I didn't get the job. It's your fault. Why did you bring me here in the first place? You should have kept me where I was before. How easy it is to allow the enemy to use fear, discouragement, and patience and overconfidence. And then in that process, to turn the blame on the God who wants to partner with us and the process of overcoming it all. But that's not the story, right? It doesn't end with fear, discouragement, impatience, and overconfidence. The word I have is yet, right? Yet God moved. 
despite fear and discouragement, despite impatience, despite overconfidence, despite deliberate rebellion, God worked a major turnaround for his people. So despite the fear and discouragement of Joshua, they had the boldness to try again. Despite Achan's sin, God brought cleansing that led to victory. Despite Achan's greed, which said there's not enough, I've got to take it now, God blessed them with abundance by saying, take the spoils for yourself. Despite defeat, God brought success. He spoke, he gave them strategy, he overcame the obstacles, and he gifted them with the victory that they had been promised. This is the challenge for us as we're walking in the kingdom of God. Part of the challenge for you in your role in the world, part of the challenge of our church as we press forward, are you in your life and are we as a church gonna hold back out of fear and discouragement and not do the things that God is asking us to do? You've written a name on a three by five card and you've stuck it on that board as a statement of faith that you wanna see this person come to faith. Are you gonna allow fear and discouragement prevent you from being God's instrument and leading that person closer to Jesus? Or are we gonna allow impatience and overconfidence to cause us to jump into things too quickly and get in situations that we regret and not have the time and resources and bandwidth to do the stuff that God wants us to do? Or will we partner with him, listen to his guidance, be diligent and perhaps rigorous in following the instructions that he gives us. And then rather than try and take the credit for ourselves for the victory, will we give it to him and trust that he's the one that will bring us the victory that's been promised. God had promised Israel the land. He was showing them time and time again that he was gonna give it to them. And God has promised us a plentiful harvest, a flourishing church, life in abundance, joy, peace, patience, self-control. He's promised us perseverance. He's promised that he'll be with us in the struggle. And he promises that he'll take us through it. And at the end, that he will come, that he'll come back, that we'll stand before him and all things will be put right. Will we partner with him, listen to him, and be his agents in bringing that now or not? I'm going to pray in a moment, but I have a question that I want you to think about in little groups. So I'd like you to just share briefly and then, and then pray. Um, and so the question is simply, which of these are you most susceptible to? Fear, discouragement, impatience, overconfidence. Which are you most susceptible to? And maybe why? And then I I want you to pray for each other in your group. You don't need to know all the details of the story. You don't need a bunch of examples, but just pray that in the place of fear, there'd be faith, that in the place of discouragement, there'd be hope, in the place of impatience, there'd be patience, in the place of overconfidence, we'd be solidly confident in the power of our God to bring the victory that he's promised. So let me pray. God, thank you that you don't allow our fear and you don't allow our impulsiveness to stop us from knowing you. And that you're the God who even when on the extremes we get in the way of what you want to do, that you graciously and kindly and patiently and gently uh, turn things around so that your way is, is the way that happens. God, we want to see uh, a church that's healthy, We want to see our lives abundant. We want to see the friends and family that don't know you come to saving knowledge of you. God, we want to see freedom from sin. We want to see healing. We want to see hope and confidence as we walk in the world. And so God, we need your help. Would you help us overcome the brokennesses of our personalities and our postures? Would you help us when the circumstances of the world push us one direction or the other? Would you help us to stop to seek your face, to uh, receive your empowerment, and to partner with you in the work that you're calling us to do. Um, So I thank you for being gracious. Thank you uh, for overcoming our limitations. Would you help us uh, to move forward in confident faith in you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.